episode number 145 of the Wholesome Fertility Podcast. Welcome to the Wholesome Fertility Podcast. I'm Michelle, a fertility acupuncturist here to provide you with resources on how to create a wholesome approach to your fertility journey. My guest today is Nora Deborah. Nora is a preconception health coach, holistic nutritionist, and fertility awareness practitioner who helps women prepare their bodies for pregnancy and have a healthy baby after 30. Nora teaches women how to optimize their hormones and fertility by harnessing the power of their menstrual cycle with nutrition and self-care practices. So welcome to the podcast, Nora. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So can you share your story and how you got into helping women with fertility? Absolutely. I'd love to. It's a little bit of a personal story. I feel like a lot of maybe professionals and practitioners in this space kind of come in from their personal story. So I am, uh, as a preconception health coach, uh, I'm myself a 37-year-old woman who wants to start a family and have babies. And it has not happened yet for me, but I know it's going to be happening for me in the next couple of years. So as a health professional, being a holistic nutritionist, being a yoga instructor, a personal trainer, and now I'm a fertility awareness practitioner, I was like, you know what? In my early 30s, I was like, let me just do what I can for myself to optimize my health, my health the best way I can, so that I can prepare my body and have babies later in life. And as a practitioner, I was went out, did all this research. And I was like, I am so overwhelmed. There is so much information out here. And somebody who's in this space as a practitioner, if this is overwhelming for me, I can just imagine what it's like for other people. So as I started moving through my 30s um, and started applying all these principles, for me, I just had realized and noticed for a lot of women I was talking to, friends, family, that um, there was a big need for this. So that's when I decided to really shift and really hone in on my niche and specify with this preconception, um, this preconception space, because when I first came into the health and wellness world in my late 20s, early 30s, this is actually my second career. I first had a corporate job for eight years as a human resources professional. Um, I was just working generally with um, men and women, and I focused on gut health. But that had really morphed and changed, especially as I moved through the early to mid part of my 30s and just started to see this need for women really understanding their bodies, knowing how it works, how to understand their cycle, how to to optimize their cycle, how to optimize their hormones at the end goal to help with fertility and at the end of the day, help women get pregnant. So that's kind of the background. (laughs) <laughs> awesome. So, I mean, it's it's obviously a lot of us, so many of us start out as patients. When I first started to go to an acupuncturist, I mean, I was I would miss three months of my period. And looking back, I probably had undiagnosed PCOS. I pretty much checked the boxes. Right. And had I not gone beforehand, I wouldn't have been able to conceive. And I know that. And it's it's so crazy how just something so simple can totally fix and change your, your path. I mean, so many times it's not that complicated and we're given the birth control pill or we're giving like a lot more than we actually need to Mm -hmm. regulate. And you also mentioned an important thing is the gut health. Gut health is so important. If you can get the gut health in check, just that alone can make such a difference. It will change your whole being. And that's when I first graduated from nutrition school, like that was my path. Well, it still is my passion, but that's what I was like wanting to shout on the rooftops everywhere. Everybody needs to learn and understand how their gut works. Like I remember when I went to school and I was like, I I didn't even know that my stomach was located up on the left side under my rib cage. (laughs) I thought my stomach was down by my uterus. And I'm like, no, that's your small intestines. So I was like, how do I not know this as an adult? Just the basics of how my body works. And so, Yeah. yeah. So, so I first started with the gut health piece. And I mean, the key components there is, you know, I always like to say to my clients, you're not only what you eat, but you're also what you absorb, what you digest, what you assimilate, Mm -hmm. and what you excrete, because you could be eating the healthiest diet in the world. But if you don't have a healthy gut, then you're not able to reap the benefits of it. And as we now know, from all of this research, 
you know, the microbiome is an organ in and of itself. And it's, mm -hmm. it, it's responsible for running your metabolism, for running your immune system, for helping lower inflammation in the body, for mental health. Like the seat of our health is almost sit, it sits inside of our digestive tract. So that, that was kind of like the first, the first kind of step in my health and wellness profession. And then I use that as now as, as a big pillar and a big part of the foundation of what I do when I work with my preconception clients. So what are common, common causes that you do see for that cause an imbalance in the gut health? Mm -hmm. So basic things here, I would say is, first of all, um, just people not eating an, an optimized kind of whole nutrient dense diet or having a diet that is a little bit more acidic, that would be that that would be ideal. So, uh, you know, even if we are eating healthy, fresh foods and salads and such, you know, a lot of us are are um, are fueled on caffeine for a good chunk of the day and caffeine mm -hmm. in and of itself, whether it's through coffee, whether it's through caffeine, whether it's drinking some Cokes or having too much chocolate can be very acidic to the body. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, so just, I mean, a bunch of, a few, a, a few gut health components here. And I would say telltale signs are is first off, just looking at your bowel movements because a lot of people aren't even pooping uh, even right. once a day. Ideally, yeah. we want to be pooping two to three times a day. That is like, think about it, one meal in, one meal out. And so people who, you know, I say one poop a day is almost considered constipation. And so if we're not able to, like, we rid the toxins in our body every single day from our bowel movements. And if we cannot, you know, if we can excrete, that's why I say you're not only what you eat, you're what you digest, assimilate, and also what you excrete. So I'm seeing clients who are, you know, not having healthy, regular bowel movements, maybe they're having too much caffeine or coffee in the day, because their hormones are shot, and they're exhausted, and they just need the caffeine to get them through. This can be very acidic to the body. Uh, in addition to that, it also depends on what their uh, history has been with birth control, antibiotic use, because this is going to really right. um, change that that it's, it's going to put your body in what's called dysbiosis. So we've got good mm -hmm. and bad bacteria in the gut. And we need, we need both good and bad. It's never about eradicating the bad entirely. It's about having that healthy balance of both so that we have this symbiotic relationship between the good and the bad bacteria. And so right. depending on, you know, antibiotic medication use in the past, if they're currently on anything now, that is also going to disrupt the microbiome. So uh, these are just, you know, a few, a few things off the top of my head that I see a lot, especially with, yeah. with clients um, that they don't think is, you know, is they, they just don't think twice about it during the day. Right. Like it's true. Yeah. As a part of their everyday life. And like you said, sometimes it's just those small little shifts and tweaks that make a difference. Yeah, yeah. 100 percent. And when you do take antibiotics, sometimes you have to. Yes. Obviously, you know, you can't always avoid it. Mm hmm. There's different perspectives. I've heard uh, people say you should start probiotics while you're taking antibiotics. And some people say, wait until you're finished because it's just going to cancel them out anyway and do it afterwards. What are important things to bring back a healthy microbiome after a course of antibiotics? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of ways. So antibiotics will kind of remove the, the good probiotics in the digestive tract. And so there's a couple of ways that you can re inoculate your gut with these good probiotics. Um, and they can become they can come from food sources, or they could come from the supplement, a probiotic supplement. And I because I'm a nutritionist, I love to say get everything from the food source as much as you can. But there are some times when we do absolutely have to supplement. So uh, especially if you're going through a round of antibiotic, I do recommend to my clients to supplement with probiotics while they are on antibiotics. Mm -hmm. But be mindful that you are taking them with a minimum of four hours away from the antibiotic. Right. If, you, if you take it too close, you're just wasting your money, right? <laughs> because yeah. you're, it's just going to kill it all. So I would say almost it's it's almost sometimes you don't know when you're going to take the antibiotic. But if you know a round of medication or antibiotic are coming up, I would almost double dose the probiotics leading up to the medication and the antibiotic, then supplementing during making sure you're taking at least 
four hours of a break bet uh, between the antibiotic and the probiotic. And then post after as well, doing what's called like a therapeutic dose of a probiotic. So a general maintenance dose of a probiotic now is anywhere between 10 to 15 million CFUs, sorry, billion, not million, 10 to 15 mm. billion colony forming units, CFU, you'll see that on the back of the bottle. Um, so, a, and, and you can have a therapeutic dose can be anywhere between 25 to 150 billion colony forming units. And this is all just, there's a lot of variables that I'd have to kind of talk to a client to understand how to best dose them. But I would say for sure, if you're going to double the dose of a maintenance dose, dose after the uh, antibiotic use, you could go up, let's say you have a pill, a probiotic supplement that is 15 billion, just double it, just take two right. for like an additional week. And then you can go back to your maintenance dose, or get it in from, you know, a nice quarter of a cup of healthy, delicious sauerkraut every single day yes. <laughs> or kimchi or drinking that kimchi yeah. here. There's a lot of different ways that, you, and I would still do that during your antibiotic dose. Enjoy the kefir, enjoy the sauerkraut yeah. and get it from the food source as well. For sure. And then also a prebiotic, which is something that a lot of times people miss. Yes. Yes. The prebiotics. No, you're not. I mean, I don't, the prebiotics mainly come, I find, from like the food sources, which is onions, yeah. garlic, artichoke. Yeah, all of that stuff gives you a lot of those prebiotics as well to help feed the probiotics. So, right. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, because people think, oh, I'll just take probiotics, I'm fine. But it's important to also eat certain foods so that you're giving it a place to really <laughs> grow roots, grow. so to speak. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. So, so this repair, actually, I've got a four step model that I kind of use with my clients to help them organize in their brain. Um, Cause it's a lot of information. It can be very overwhelming and I try to kind of simplify things <laughs> as much as possible. And this is actually my third step in my four, my have, I have what's called my four R's to kind of getting pregnant or helping you get pregnant. And my third step is repair is all about mm -hmm. repairing the gut. Um, right. Because as mentioned, it's kind of a cornerstone of our health. So let's go over those four R's. I'd love to. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I actually, um, the first R was, is remove. So what we, you know, what we want to make sure or what we want to do with our body is, you know, Michelle, I, I know, as you know, this, a lot of people know this. Sometimes we just have to remind ourselves is that the body knows how to thrive. The body knows how to, yep. how to, what it needs to do. We don't have to tell it what to do. It knows what to do, but we just have to create that optimal environment for it. So the first R is removing, removing the noxious foods, the noxious substances um, that we're putting into our body on a daily basis that is bogging us down, that is inflaming us, that is imbalancing our hormones. So as a holistic nutritionist, we're going to stick to foods for this podcast because I can go on a tangent forever about many things. <laughs> but with regards to the foods, I say, you know, there's, there's about a handful of foods that I say, it's time to completely remove these or greatly reduce and minimize them because everybody's on their own journey and everybody is at their own state of health. And it's important to kind of take baby steps and move slowly right. towards our goals. Otherwise we set ourselves up for failure. So the first, um, the first food that I would say to remove or greatly reduce is actually caffeine. There's been a lot of studies that do show that you know, um, excessive amount of caffeine intake does uh, impact our hormones enough to impact fertility. I know recently there was a study done that showed how, uh, a study of women who drank about 300 milligrams of caffeine per day, which is about three cups of coffee. They found that they had 27, their, their, um, their time to conceive was reduced by 27% um, just by drinking that much caffeine alone every day. So Caffeine is a big one. It messes yeah. with our cortisol. What about um, matcha or green tea? I just want to kind of throw that in there because I think people yes. think that it's, okay, I'm having this kind of caffeine versus that kind of caffeine. That's a great question because I actually, I was, uh, I kind of did this to myself recently as well. Caffeine, and I'll explain my personal experience in a moment, but caffeine is caffeine. It doesn't matter which form it's coming from, whether it's green tea, whether it's matcha, whether it's yerba mate, whether it's ginseng, whether it's cacao from the cacao pod, whether it's mm -hmm. uh, from coffee, whether espresso, caffeine is caffeine. And so 
it's just being mindful of how much caffeine consumption that you are having every day. I'm a very active person myself. I love to exercise. And for me, I was taking this shot of pre-workout every morning as my little pick me up and go to. And I'm like, this is not bad. I'm not drinking coffee. It's fine. Only 100 milligrams of caffeine. Let me tell you, I've been doing that for like the last five years. And it's <laughs> a month ago, I decided to stop because my health coach was telling, asking me, Nora, do you, are you having caffeine? I'm like, no, I don't have coffee. And then she's like, and then she dug deeper. And then, cause I, I suffer from PMS on and off. Mm. And so mm. that's something that I've um, removed myself now. And I'll tell you, my sleep quality has improved like through the roof. I've, yeah. uh, my, my cravings have gone down. So that's just, and that the source of caffeine in my pre-workout is, um, is yerba mate. And it doesn't matter, mm. caffeine is caffeine. So right. just being mindful that's of, right. yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned something actually that I really want to point out. So you are an expert, you know all this stuff and you're still using a health coach. And I love that because yes. it just goes to show, you know, some people are like, oh, well, I know, I know I can do it myself. I'm fine. You know, it doesn't matter how much, you know, we can always use the help and that extra perspective because it's weird. We get so blind to ourselves to the point where I just recently finally said, oh, wow, I did have PCOS. Like it took me years and I, and I see people all the time. I tell them you have these signs, go to the doctor. I could see it so clearly with other people. You cannot see it with yourself. So well, it's so it, important to yes, have a coach. Yes, absolutely. I, I tell my clients that too. I'm like, listen, I have a health coach. I, and it yeah. was boggling my mind where I'm like, where it like, my PMS is just driving me bonkers. Like I know I literally do this for a living. This is what I do to yeah. help people for a living. I know what I need to do. It doesn't matter. Do, it doesn't <laughs> when matter. When it comes to yourself, it's all... a whole different ball game. <laughs> exactly. So I'm human as well. Um, but that was like, literally this just happened to Michelle in the last, like it's been three weeks since I haven't had caffeine and I'm coming, I just finished ovulating. So I'm coming into my luteal phase now. So I'm really interested my coach is like, Nora, give me one cycle without any caffeine, no green tea. I'm trying to even stay away yeah. from chocolate, like nothing. Yeah. And I, I'm diligent. I'm sticking to it. First two weeks was hard. I was a zombie. I had the withdrawal symptoms, but I'm like, I can't believe this is happening to me. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> It's great, yeah. though. It's great because yes. we can all learn. And, and I think that that's the key point. Really important point is that yes. it doesn't matter how much we know for other people we all have blind spots we can always grow and it and it's a it's a beautiful thing yes um so what other what other yes. things would you remove okay so caffeine is one the second one is industrial seed oils so vegetable oil canola oil think about any oil that is made in a uh, like any well yeah okay so any oil that is made from a seed that isn't supposed to be made into an oil so this Mm -hmm. This is, yeah, they're called vegetable seed oils, which is um, like uh, rape seed oil, canola oil, even on the container. So rape seed oil, I've heard. Sorry, rape seed, of... rape seed, oh, okay. not, not grape seed. Not grape seed, because grape seed I've Correct. heard good things about. Grape seed okay. is amazing for cooking at high heat because it's stable at high heat. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, got it. Yes. Um, so what oils do you recommend in general? I know we're kind of like jumping around That's but, okay. um, because grape seed oil. Yes. I've heard great things about a lot of people cook with olive oil, which is not stable in high heat. Correct. That it's is an correct. Extra, it's an important thing to kind of mention. Yeah. So, so, um, if you're listening, just get a piece of paper if you haven't already. <laughs> There's a lot of little nuggets <laughs> I'm going to be giving you, yeah. but the high heat oils that are sort of the, the three key oils that I like to cook and recommend for my clients um, for high heat is coconut oil. Now, a lot mm -hmm. of people don't like the flavor. So if you don't like the flavor, just, just omit it. Um, yeah. Grape seed oil is another one that's great for high heat and avocado oil. Avocado is another yeah, one that's, I yeah, love, love it. avocado. I yes. love it. Or butter. Yeah. If you have grass fed butter, butter is. Or ghee. Or ghee. Exactly. Which is the clarified yeah. butter. Yeah. So there's lots and lots of options to choose from. Um, some of my clients cook in lard and like, you know, like different lard that they collect from cooking animal protein. Um, but if we're just staying with the basics, it's grapeseed, avocado, and coconut. Mm -hmm. And then extra yeah. virgin olive oil. Think about using that and keeping it as more of like a garnish. 
um, yeah. for your salads or drizzling it on. I, I literally drizzle olive oil on my eggs in the morning. I think it tastes delicious. It's got so many benefits. Exactly. It's a polyunsaturated fat, which is different from a saturated fat, which you're getting from the grape seed, the coconut and uh, the mm-hmm. avocado. And so what happens when that polyunsaturated fat with the EVOO, that's just the little mm-hmm. short, short, short version I yeah. use. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the molecular structure of it when it is exposed to high heat like twists and changes and um and then i mean we don't taste a difference but we when we ingest that it's inflammatory to our body inside and so yes. so that's something to think about when you're when you're using i guess that for high heat so think twice when you're using extra virgin olive oil for high heat yeah, so for sure yeah, so I'd say industrial seed oils, no canola, no vegetable, no rapeseed oil. If you just Google industrial seed oils, you'll see a long laundry list and just whatever you've got in your cover, cupboard, throw it out. They are extremely inflammatory, extremely inflammatory to the body. Mm-hmm. If you even want to learn the whole process of how it's made, they bleach it. They're, it's it's crazy. It's You're not mm-hmm. consuming real food. So yeah. industrial seed oils. What do you think of uh, sunflower salsa. oil? Well, so sunflower. Yeah, it's so there's safflower and sunflower, which are yeah, yeah they they I believe if I my memory is correct, it's under the industrial seed oil category. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I do the caffeine, the industrial seed oils, and um, soy is a big one. Um. Now, when I say soy, I mean unfermented soy. Fermented soy is okay. But unfermented soy in the form of tofu is a no-no. In the form of soy milk is a no-no. This is very estrogenic promoting in the body. And Mm -hmm. people are drinking soy milk like, you know, it's just like water every single day. And that could really disrupt and imbalance uh, that that delicate balance of hormones in our body. So I say as best as you can, again, depending on how much soy you eat, unfermented soy uh so that's also even like edamame that you get from like the sushi restaurant i don't touch that Mm -hmm. anymore um Mm -hmm. soy milk and tofu but then you can if you if you're if you're vegan or vegetarian they they really sometimes um are you know they're like well what do i do for my protein so fermented soy in the form of tempeh is totally good Mm -hmm. and that's yeah that's okay um in the form of uh soy sauce tamari Tamari and soy sauce is fermented, so that is still good and okay. And there's something called miso paste. Have you ever cooked with miso paste? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's delicious. delicious. Yeah. yeah. So that's fermented soy as well, and that's totally uh, okay to use. But so if you have soy milk in your fridge and it's something that you put in your grocery cart every single day, I would think twice about the next time uh, about doing that next time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So soy, and then the last one is um, obviously sugar, refined sugar. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we don't have to go down the rabbit hole about that one, but again, very yeah. acidic, very <laughs> acidic to the body. Uh, yeah. And I don't mean, you know, fresh fruit is good. There's natural sugars in a lot of foods that we eat, but I just mean like the pastries, the cookies, the the refined white sugar. The white sugar. It's just yeah. going to, it's going to steal juice, though, exactly yeah. all of the concentrated juices um, is just, you know, uh, omit, omit or greatly reduce as much as you can, because again, I'm human. And I, Michelle, I love my ice cream. I love ice cream. So <laughs> I will allow myself ice cream and I will allow myself cookies from time to time. I am not perfect. Mm-hmm. I do not complete, yes. you know, this sugar. Sometimes I will allow that little treat. Um, but yeah. for the most part, you know, I'm all about 90, 10 or 80, 20 rule. It just, it depends on your state of health and what your goals are for achieving pregnancy. And that's, that's a sustainable, healthy attitude. I think mm-hmm. in general, if not getting too constrictive with your diet and allowing yourself those those moments because then you don't feel as bad when you're not doing it because you know exactly you're not imprisoned exactly exactly yeah so and then the the last two pieces I will quickly mention these because these are big everybody thinks about this all the time is gluten and dairy those are two big ones that you know a lot of my clients ask me about And I really say it totally depends on the individual. It depends on your intolerance to them Um, because I can have gluten and dairy and I'm okay. However, for me, I've got a threshold. If I have too much dairy, then I do not feel well. I break out, my digestion is off, but it it, it totally depends. So you've got to really be able to pay attention to your body and understand these signs and symptoms. Um, Is it bloating you? Are you getting skin rashes, headaches? Are you not sleeping well? 
Are you having explosive diarrhea? Like, you know, there's, there's your body is all talking to you every day on, on what you're doing. Right. So, so yeah, gluten and dairy, I would say, um, are individual dependent, but I say again, you know, I try and minimize it, but, um, I, I don't completely omit it from, from my diet and, and work specifically with my clients on their lifestyle, on their health, depending on what that looks like for them. Cool. Mm-hmm. And then the next one is replace. Replace. Yeah. Yeah. So first we remove, we want to remove all the noxious substances that are, bo- that are bogging us down. And now we want to replace and bring back in all the nutrient dense fertility foods that are going to kind of ramp us back up to keep us nice and healthy and optimize our body and optimize our egg reserves as we prepare for pregnancy. So there's also another handful of foods that I'd love to share with you. Uh, the first one is dark leafy greens. I don't think this is a surprise to many people. We're always saying eat more greens, eat more greens, but specifically for fertility, they're filled with chlorophyll, folate, and fiber. And mm-hmm. folate, as we know, is a lot of women supplement with folate as they prepare for pregnancy and during pregnancy in their prenatal. So we get that in its natural form in all the dark leafy greens. Fiber, lots of amazing fiber. We need fiber to have healthy, regular bowel movements. Our bowel, our, our stool is made up of fiber, bacteria, and toxins, and water. Drink enough water. Um, so the fiber in the dark leafy greens is great, and the chlorophyll is good for cleaning the blood and just kind of cleansing the system. So dark leafy greens. Uh, the second one I would say is um, collagen. Collagen and gelatin is great for preparing the body for um, pregnancy. And you can get collagen now in a variety of forms, in powder supplemental form. I actually make bone broth all the time. Yes, bone broth. Bone yeah, broth. Like it's say. it's not just a trend. Like it's a thing. It's a real thing. Oh, yeah. oh it's been it's been done for thousands of years in Chinese yes. culture. So. <laughs> yes, yes, and same thing. Like in in as. Like, so I'm Jewish and growing up, my grandmother was always making chicken soup and my mom still makes mm-hmm. chicken soup and it's called like the Jewish penicillin or something because oh, whenever totally. anybody- no, I'm Jewish too. Oh, my there you mom go. Says it. Oh, yeah, I know that from your last name. She said, yeah. yeah. She said, uh, it's the Jewish penicillin. It's the Jewish penicillin, <laughs> exactly. So, but the key to making the bone broth in my, uh, from the research I've done and also what I've found uh, with myself is not, is first of all, getting- um, the ch- you can use bones, you can do beef bones. I like to do the chicken, but uh, chicken bones, but adding the chicken feet. Have you heard about the chicken feet? Yes, my grandmother used to do it because we're, we're Middle Eastern. So my grandmother, I was just talking to my daughter a couple of days ago. I'm like, you know, something that is actually really delicious, but you'd be surprised. And she's like, oh, gross. And I'm like, it was actually really good. Yeah, I mean, you're not like, you're you're just boiling it. You're just boiling it and then you're oh, discarding. Oh, I, I ate it. Oh, you ate it? Oh my gosh, Michelle, yeah, I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, it really well. Yeah, she would clean it really well. Wow. It's just cartilage It's yeah. just cartilage. Okay, so I have not eaten the feet. Maybe that's what I will aspire to. I've gone further than you. <laughs> but I, I'm but, extreme. Right? No, it's, but I know it's so good for you. And, and so when you boil it in the broth, that is what actually is is pulling out all of the gelatin. So you're, when you make broth with chicken feet and you kind of keep it in the fridge over a few days, you're going to notice it, it really gelatinizes. So it kind of gets into this like thick kind of jello gel, jello ish type of consistency as soon as you melt it and put it in the pot to heat it up it totally melts but if you notice in the fridge like why is this looking like jello it's like ding 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 you're winning if that's the case oh totally (laughs) because you've kind of pulled all of that delicious collagen and gelatin out of out of the bones so so chicken feet if you're cooking with with bone broth if you're cooking bone broth and you're doing it on your own add chicken feet um it's amazing it's amazing really really good so collagen um gelatin dark leafy greens and um healthy fats i mean this uh, like healthy omega-3 fats but really understanding and remembering that all of our hormone the precursor to all of our hormones is actually fat so you know um there was this fat phobia for a long time i think we've come past that um but just remembering to make sure that you're getting in you know healthy fats throughout your day uh, whether it's through the oils that you're cooking with or adding, you know, nuts and seeds to your salads or having them as snacks. Uh, lots of healthy av- avocado is like the best fertility fruit, we call it. it so is. it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, really getting in your avocados, uh, your nut butters. And yeah, don't be afraid of fat. Do not be afraid of fat. So fat is another is another big one. 
And, and full-fat dairy, if you are not sensitive to dairy, yogurt, full-fat yogurt is a great one because it just, it has the antibiotic, uh, probiotics, sorry, yes. probiotics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. And and the last one I want to mention about the, about the replace, is, I mean, obviously always, you know, eat a rainbow, lots of whole nutrient-dense foods. You're never going to go wrong with that. But one thing that I, I mean, working with women for many years, we are chronic protein under eaters for the most part i see like generally speaking i find a lot of women just don't eat enough protein for their body mass and so yeah. eating healthy amounts of protein for your body is so crucial for making sure because i mean the building blocks of life come from protein you know the, the, mm -hmm. they come from amino acids and so when you're preparing that body i mean when you get pregnant your baby takes everything from you it zaps you of energy so it's so important to ramp up all these nutrient stores in advance as much as you can so that you can have a little bit more uh, you can have a better pregnancy experience and a better postpartum experience so remember the yes. doing this up front is just literally building those foundations for everything that's going to come in the next year two years three years and you know, it's like you don't build a house on sand. You got to really yeah. make sure that you're getting the solid foundation. So that's what we're doing with all these, all these um, nutrients. And now we're on to repair. Yeah. And so we talked about repair already because I gave you a little bit of information about the gut health. But pretty much as the saying, as I said at the beginning, you could be eating the healthiest diet in the world and eating all these beautiful fertility nutrient dense foods. But if your gut is compromised, it's going to be hard for your body to assimilate all those nutrients. So my uh, few recommendations for a healthy gut, what can you do on a daily basis is eating probiotic or like eating prebiotic and probiotic friendly foods. So, um, you know, I, I love pairing a couple forkfuls of sauerkraut with my animal protein. I think it tastes great. It also aids in the process of digestion, um, getting in that kef kefir. Um, if I don't, have you heard of L glutamine? Have you heard of this nutrient called L glutamine? Yeah, L-glutamine is, is an amino acid, which is very healing to the gut as well. So just like mm. collagen powder, you can get L-glutamine powder and kind of put it in your shakes or your smoothies um, to kind of just help repair the gut if you have, if you have, you know, indigestion or a compromised gut. But um, bone broth is also really good for repairing the gut. So a lot of these yes. foods that you'll hear me talk about do kind of overlap with, you know, some of the R's. But generally right. speaking, it's all about repairing that gut, making sure that we can now, you know, digest all the foods that we're replacing into our diet. And the yeah, gut. And also, something to mention is that when yeah. you start to have the sauerkraut or, uh, you know, adding all those prebiotics, you may have some symptoms at the beginning. Yes. Good point, Michelle. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. If Because your body. So when I, I remember I first funny that you said this because I just had this memory now when I I was still working there's um, a, a hospital here that I used to work at in HR it's called sick kids it's a children's hospital I used to work at sick kids and I this was in my late, late 20s when I was like what is this kombucha thing I'm just gonna go and get and try kombucha I remember I got a kombucha I probably had like five sips of it and I was like what the heck is this I can't drink this, <laughs> this doesn't make me I feel got very good <laughs> no, I had the worst headache. I was just like, this is supposed to be a health drink. I feel like crap. <laughs> yeah. And so, but now I can guzzle kombucha like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, so when you, you build are, up to it, so start exactly, yeah. exactly. So when you start to re inoculate your gut with these healthy, friendly bacteria that it might not be used to, your body again is going to respond. So some of my clients, when I do start to supplement them with a probiotic, if I feel it's needed, they do sometimes tell me, Nora, I'm feeling a little bit bloated. Bloating is yeah. probably the most common symptom that you'll notice. But I say, mm -hmm. just stick with it. Give it, give it, you know, five to 14 days, give it at least two weeks to see how your body, um, you know, changes and responds because it, you will come past it. It's just, it's just your body kind of recalibrating itself. Yeah. Something else that I do want to mention is people who may have SIBO and not realize yes. it may not do well with traditional or like more common probiotics, but they will do well with spore based probiotics. Yes, exactly. So it, 
everything is always my answer literally is always it depends <laughs> it depends yeah. on the individual it depends on the person um yeah. but um but again if somebody who has SIBO and is looking to conceive and get pregnant and they have all of these you know and and they're not dealing with it they're not working with a practitioner to help them manage it and manage yeah. their symptoms this is going to this this is going to imbalance the body and cause problems so um, again, this this still falls under the repair umbrella. It just totally mm -hmm. depends, you know, are, do you have IBS? Do you have SIBO? Do you have chronic constipation? Do you have chronic diarrhea? Like there's so many, there's so many, yeah. there's so many kind of arms under the repair and it just depends on what you've got. You've got to bring that back to balance. So your gut is For as sure. healthy as it can be. Yeah, and I want to kind of mention that so that people are like, oh, okay, let me just go do this because it's yes. not for everybody. You really need to know what's going on with you specifically, yes, individually, and it is important to work with somebody who understands and can see that. Exactly, exactly. No, that was a good point, so thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> um, and now we're on to rebalance. <laughs> rebalance, so the last R. So just to recap, first R, remove, second R, replace, third R, repair, and then the last R is about rebalancing. So as women, our bodies are in a semi-continuous state of pregnancy every single month. That's how we were evolved, and that's what our bodies are designed to do. And so in order for us to do that, you know, we've got these hormones that are fluctuating throughout the month. And so it's about really balancing those hormones as best we can. So how do we balance those hormones? Uh, we can actually, there's a variety of different ways that we can do that, but I also, um, I I work with my clients and I help them eat for their menstrual cycle. So it's about knowing how to nourish the body in each phase or each week of your menstrual cycle to really kind of optimize your health or that hormone in that time. Because in the first two weeks, our estrogen is really rising, right? As we approach ovulation. And at that, especially in the first week of our cycle, we have our period, we're losing a lot of iron, we're losing a lot of magnesium just because of the blood that's coming out of our body. So we need to make sure we're replenishing that and um, with foods that have a lot of these nutrients in it. In addition to that, you know, and helping us rise that estrogen in the body is important to make sure we're getting, you know, our flax seed and our pumpkin seed. Those are really good in helping rise estrogen, making sure we have enough water in our system because that's going to help. That Sorry, I remember that a, a way that yeah. I help people remember that because you, you you know people get confused which ones do I take which yes. seeds should I take for which cycle, um, think about FP follicular phase flax yeah. pumpkin. <gasps> oh, I like that. Thank <laughs> you, flax FP follicular phase. Yes, but even the follicular like follicular estrogen like what is going on? There's so many names, right. but you're right. <laughs> but the more you hear it and the more you do it, like it 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 does eventually stick but it, it yeah. could be a little bit confusing up yep, front um and then uh, also as we approach ovulation our body is creating and making all the cervical mucus because we need mucus for sperm to survive so if we're chronically dehydrated you know that mucus production is not going to be as robust as we'd like it to be so even just something as simple as drinking enough water um mm -hmm. and then in the la in the last two phases of the cycle in the luteal phase um which is our post ovulatory phase our body is very sensitive to blood sugar fluctuations. Our insulin resistance is a little bit higher. And so I really coach my clients on making sure that they're protein and fat loading their day first thing in the morning, understanding and knowing how to balance their blood sugar properly so that, you know, the, you know, the, the, the reproductive hormones just follow that. So, so, I mean, a, a lot of these things that I'm talking about, about the four R's kind of weave together at the same time, but I've created this kind of method just to help everybody kind of go, okay, one phase and one step at a time so that they don't feel too overwhelmed with doing all of yeah. everything at once. <laughs> I love it. I think it's great. It, and it really does. It, it, it is so overwhelming when people it, get into the fertility journey and try to work out what they need to do. It's very overwhelming, especially when it comes to diet and nutrition so like, where do we begin? I know. And, and in addition to that, we have to remember, like, it's already such an emotionally charged space, just because if you are, you know, if you haven't started trying yet, and you're just starting to prepare your body, and you're thinking about moving, you know, in the next six months, I know I want to get pregnant. So I'm going to do everything that I can now. But once you're in that space, and maybe you've been trying without a positive test, that is, you know, you just, it, it's much more emotional, I think, at that time. And so, 
being able to first off manage your emotions with trying with understanding, you know, why hasn't this happened for me yet? With then trying to remember all the things that you want to be doing <laughs> so that you can continue yeah. to optimize for next cycle. It's a lot. It really is yeah. a lot. So, so this is precisely why I got into this space. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, this is so much fun to discuss because uh, you're very knowledgeable in this space. And I loved, um, I'm sure a lot of people get a lot of good insight, but I do want to mention, find somebody to help you because it's not something that you just want to do on your own. It's not something that you want to figure out on your own because you don't know what's underlying and certain things can actually give you an an adverse effect. So you really need to understand yourself and what your body needs specifically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'd love to share, I have a a free resource if if, um, you'd be open to it. I'd love to share with your listeners. They, I have a eat to get pregnant guide, which is just like it teaches you month, month, sorry, week by week throughout your cycle, like just briefly what's going on in your body each week, and then specifically what foods to hone in on each week. So it's part of the fourth R, which is rebalance, learning and starting to understand how to eat for your menstrual cycle. If you're interested in just downloading a simple guide on what this would look like, you can find it at naturallynora.ca backslash eat. And then it's it's a free download that's easily available for you. And you just print it, keep it on your fridge or keep it by your bedside table. And you're like, oh, I'm bleeding this week. What is Nora? What should I eat? <laughs> <laughs> and I have that website, um, that link on the episode notes. So if anybody wants to go and find it, that's where they can find it. So if people want to work with you, how can they find you? Yeah. So otherwise, I mean, there, I, my, my website is uh, www.naturallynora.ca. So I'm from Canada. So just remember it's CA, not .com. Um, or you can find me and message me. I'm very, uh, very open and love to connect with all women and men, whoever is listening, because <laughs> it's not just about the women it's also about the men yes. right the sperm health mm-hmm. um but uh on my instagram handle is naturally underscore nora awesome well thank you so much nora for coming on this is a pleasure thank you thank you so much for having me so that concludes today's episode you can find all of the links mentioned on the episode notes if you're enjoying these episodes please take a moment to share and leave a review Reviews mean everything to podcasters, and I really enjoy hearing from my listeners. You can also find me on my website at www.thewholesomelotus.com or email me at info at thewholesomelotus.com. I love hearing from my listeners. If you're interested and want updates as well as a free ebook on my top 10 fertility boosting habits, you can visit my fertility page on www.thewholesomelotus.com thewholesomelotus.com. I thank you so much for listening in and hope that you have a beautiful day.